So you're going to home and make yourself one? Huh? Pardon? Did you go home and make yourself one? No, no, no. I'd rather have you guys make one. That's the answer I was hoping for. Yeah. And I can feel a desire building up inside. Well, no, well, that one, that one, he wants Moon and brand this one are the two with original grips. That's yeah. what's pretty No, it would be, I definitely would be that one. I'm not into long to it. Oh, no, I get it. I'm just about the grip. Yeah. Hey ho! But in my mind, that's. Hello? That's 133 right there. Hi, Roy. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. That's. Uh, and in a particular, because it seems to be optimized for unarmored combat in a sense. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> You were saying it's optimized for unarmored combat? Because it's a cutter, right? This comes from, a, uh, from an age where, um, um, like that's 14th century sword. So the, the 14th century is probably the most excessively armored period that there was. Um, but um, there was a context for sword and buckler fencing, um, and that would be a judicial duel, right? And uh, we still have the we still have the rules for judicial duel, and um, they say, well, you can uh, well, you can wear as much leather and linen as you please. So these are German rules, 14th century, and you have all the details. And they say uh, you are allowed to carry up to three swords into the barriers, a buckler, uh, as much linen and leather as you please, bare head, so no head protection. On your hands, you must not have anything but uh, thin leather gloves. And then interestingly, they say that the, um, the top part of your hose has to be cut, so no shoes, and you have to cut off the uh, top part, the top of the, the front part of your, um, so. The uh, shame is this. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the front of the shoe would have to be removed. Nothing was I don't know. You know, I think it's probably more. Um, they, they were obsessed with um, making sure this met, it is an even match. And um, at that time, people um, were still walking on the balls of their foot, as opposed to us who are, have become heel walkers due to our uh, footwear. So um, you annihilate the chance that somebody slips just because this. His, his soul is too, I don't know, too greasy, too, 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 too. That's that, yeah, so, I mean, that's uh, my reasoning behind it. The rest uh, is, of course, perfectly clear. You want to make sure um, that uh, the primary targets, the head and the hands, are, uh, can be wounded if you can access them. You're good enough to do it. Exactly. And the rest, uh, as I said, with the holes, I don't think uh, it has anything to do with... Uh, any hidden weapon, James Bond, like, you know, or something like that. And then there's another rule which is interesting is um, uh, generally you would have to snap off um, the scabbard shape. So, assuming you decide to do all three swords, you would have a sword on your left, on your right, and one in your hands. And uh, it says if the scabbard shape is of iron, you have to break it off. So you couldn't use it as a weapon? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, with I mean, uh, uh, these rules in the 14th century were copied and still in use, but they were copied from an original ma uh, a text from the 13th century. Who knows? I mean, when it's rules, pretty round too. 14th century, yeah. Uh, so, so, uh, so, what I'm, so what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, um, rules may so if it's more solid, uh, I can see their definitely original stop meaning at one point, but yeah. because it has been that way all the time, it's a tradition. Exactly, it's a tradition, and then people don't really know what it means. And, and, but but it has been that way all the time. So so maybe some of the rules that we uh, find. Uh, maybe a contemporary wouldn't have been able to tell you, uh, or would have been bewildered by the question in the first place when you asked, like, why, why do you... What, what's the matter? Yeah, it's like, Get in there and fight. It's like, it's like, it's like so asking, why is the sky blue? Well, now we can tell you. <laughs> yeah, no, they yeah. knew why, but forgot over time. Yes, right I out can, of college, she, she I can told her seven years now. She married a nice Austrian guy, so right. she's well, never you know. can't. It, yeah, I, 
Well, a strange question. I've often thought this. We find so many different weights of blades. Could it be that, that even in the Viking Age, all through history, the people had swords for blade fencing when they were unarmored and to carry around town, and then other ones for battle if they wanted slightly heftier blades not to break in, in Well, I'd say if you have the resources and if you have the choice, any, uh, any sensible human being would pick the best tool available. So uh, if you're if you're sitting in an armory all day long and uh, <laughs> and it uh, and they say okay there's a feud our no, town has to like equip the town militia uh, uh, and we have to man the wall our guild has to man the wall over there and I have the full choice of weapons then I choose the then I choose uh, what um, serves my purpose best if they say um, we have to walk, walk out the city gates and confront the other then I pick a different set of uh, uh, weapons and armor if I'm uh, uh, a poor, starved soldier on campaign in 14th century France, I may well uh, find it more appealing to sell off my armor to get a, uh, to get a bite, to get something to eat. So, um, yeah, I mean... Um, if you have the resources and the money, you could have multiple swords for different occasions. If you have the resources, yeah, yeah. Like and if they you might have done some it. of the Viking graves, uh, you you would have a, a sword, a sax, a couple of axes, a couple of spearheads. And, yeah. but I was also talking about weights of swords and balances and stuff. They could have had some that they liked better for armor combat. Well, that's uh, uh, the more contexts you have. I mean, that's pretty clear with European swords. Uh, the more contexts you have, uh, contexts of actions, the more. Uh, the more different shapes and forms of weapons we have. Like if you look at the sword, it's quite telling that um, uh, it changed shape according to re battle, uh, according to combat requirements. And then uh, when you had a lot of different combat requirements, then, um, then you would have a lot of different types. Like in the 15th century, you had all sorts of uh, very, very different uh, shapes of um, swords. But if you go back to the 8th, there's really not that much difference. Uh, Except for weights and balance slightly. Well, you, you get some variation, yeah. but you also have to look at what their terminology was. You know, we, we, they tell us they had arming swords, riding swords. They didn't refer to them as, you know, this sword is a, you know, this way or that way. They even thought of them as descriptive of how they were intended or purposed to be used. Right, so even in, in each time period... How they identified them. They didn't think right. of them as, you know, types like we do today or anything. Uh, well, that's why, like, in the 13th century, when you start seeing a lot more male, you start seeing heavier blades and then more pointy blades mixed in at the same time. But yeah. different, yeah. You see more robust blades is the way to put it. Yeah, and, but then that kind of goes away because it doesn't really help anymore to have a heavier blade to do the job, you know. They still have the two-handers, but they tend to not be so, as heavy as some of the earlier 13th century blades you run into. Yeah, and you've got a lot of... Any individual, we're human beings like still, and any individual in a social group where weapons and combat are part of that is going to evolve into what we see in any group of military guys today. You know, you, you get them all in a room, they're not all going to pick the same thing, even in the same... Uh, same uh, conflict. The more skillful fighter might want a lighter blade that he can well, get into niches with. The I, uh, easier or another one might pick a heavier blade and pray pretty much and try to yeah. use a little more force. Yeah. What you're aware of and there's more of a realization in a room of soldiers today about the um, tr truth in the minds of the fighters than what a lot of reenactors today apply to the Middle Ages. And by that I mean, they all, a group of soldiers today realize that if I walk into a room and I'm in a combat situation and there's a pistol on the table, I'm going to use that tool to the best effect possible with my skills and what that tool can accomplish. And they might change how they use it because of the tool that it is. Same thing with swords in the medieval period. Yeah, so Guys weren't prancing that. around going like, well, my sword has to be an inch longer here or I just can't fight today. Right. Uh, that, that's, we think of it sometimes in that way and that's just completely wrong. 
the best martial artist as an individual who is in a situation and has a tool and realizes the most efficient and effective way to use that tool in that context on that day. So we get so wrapped up in thinking that swords, ooh, at this, at this year they got wider, or this year they got heavier. And oftentimes that's probably misleading us in our understanding. It's not necessarily true. But no, because it's it's much more about the um, evolution of the sword always being questions asked and answered. And, and like Roland stated, there's a lot of samples, and you've got a big range, and you stated it too. There's a big range of, if you average the weights, it's not going to be as extreme as most people think. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the context of the moment is... The general sword is not going to be very heavy. Exactly. Yeah. The context of the moment, good work. I'm going to dig that one. That's fine. You can <laughs> add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> I steal from you every day, man. <laughs>